the spiritual remix series. I started actually. I've got ten messages. This is the tenth message in a series called "Remixing Your Spirit." I told you, was it would be nine or ten weeks ago? <laughs> I'd have to look on the calendar. That you are basically made up of intelligence, talents, personality, and spirituality, and that if you will excel in the realm of your spiritual life, God will take all the rest of you and do something wonderful with it. Amen? So I've spent the last uh, nine weeks telling you the different ways that a spiritual mind thinks. And then I got to the tenth, I said, there's no way I can preach a series on how to have a spiritual mind without talking about prayer. Amen? Can't be spiritual without prayer. And here was my dilemma. I'll tell you something about me. You want to know something about me? I, I didn't say I have a theory. I said, I'll tell you something about me. My least favorite sermons to prepare are the ones that are predictable. I, I don't like preparing Christmas sermons. I love Christmas, but what else can you say about the manger, you know? Uh, those kind of things. In fact, it's, it's difficult. So when I got to this prayer, I thought, I have preached prayer to these people so many times in so many ways. How do I possibly come at it that a, way, a way that would be somewhat new and creative and a way that would catch our attention and maybe, dare we say, enrich our prayer lives? And so I really began to pray, God, help me not to be boring. God, help me not to be predictable. And as I prayed and I read the passages that I could think of about prayer and I read the, what I consider some of the best authorities on prayer and some things begin to come in my spirit. So if you'll allow me, if you'll open up your heart, I think you'll learn some things about prayer today that at least I've never taught you before. And uh, perhaps you haven't heard anywhere, hopefully. A spiritual mind sees prayer as life. A spiritual mind sees prayer as life. That's point number 10. When you look about all the people in the Bible, they're all unique. They lived in different situations. They had different challenges. All the things going on in all the lives of the biblical heroes, you go back to Moses and Noah and David, and you get into the apostles and obviously Jesus. There's one thing, though everything else might have been different, there's one thing that is constant. Every one of them had a good prayer life. Every one of them were people of authentic prayer. And so one of the most common assumptions of the Bible, you know that word assumption? You know what you do when you assume? <laughs> what? <laughs> there are some things you can assume. One of the most common assumptions of the Bible is that God's people will be people of prayer. Notice Jesus said, when you pray, in Matthew 6, 5, not if you pray. When you pray, not if you pray. There is an assumption there that God's people will pray. So he says, when you pray, pray like this. Prayer is what brings us into the Spirit's presence. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. When did this happen? After they prayed. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing in Thessalonians 5, 17. So, I want to ask you a few rhetorical questions. You know the difference between a rhetorical question and a regular question? A rhetorical question, you're supposed to think about it. Rhetoric, yeah. A, a real question, you answer out loud. So don't be answering out loud. All right? Just think about this. Who is the center of your life? Who is the center of your life? Because I think, if anything, prayer is designed to move Jesus at the center point of your life. Say amen. Who is at the center of your life? And here's one of those kind of new revelations as I began to pray and listen to other teachers on prayer. We began to realize that sometimes in spite of God, are you listening? It's going to get a little algebraic here. Sometimes in spite of the fact that God is number one in my life, He's not the center of my life. 
He's number one, one in my life because I put him up there and I say, God, no one's like you. No one's compared to you. You are above all else in my life. I'll do everything you ask. No one else has that privilege. I, I will give you the first tenth of everything I, I, I make. I will, Lord, I will go wherever. I'll move wherever you want me to move. I'll do whatever. So God is number one. But here's what I get in the habit of doing, and I think you're, some of you are going to join me in this, is you get in the habit of putting God number one in your life, and then two, three, four, five, and six is where we live our lives. We live our lives tagging bases. To, now, the, I'm not saying he has lost his priority. He's still there as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we'll still do whatever he says. But we, we are the center of our lives. What do I want? What do I need? Where am I going? What, what's going on? What are the boxes I need to check out? Because you see, the Bible teaches me that God is not just a box I check. He's my life. For me to live is Christ. Amen. Amen. Is God with you or is he just watching you? Is Christ in you or is he simply aware of you? Because when he becomes in me, he's not a prayer that I pray to start the day or to end the day. He is with me all day. Hello? He is in me, and in me he becomes the hope of glory. He is functioning in me, not just where he's number one, but in two, three, four, five, six, and 99, he's right in the middle of all, everything on the priority list. He's in there, he's living, he's breathing, he is with me, and not just observing me. Don't you know that... Remember when I was a kid, I, I don't know if you remember it. When I was a kid, we used to sing this song, you know, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little ears what you hear. Because there's a father up above who will crush you in his love if you do the wrong thing. So we kind of had this idea that God was observing us making meticulous notes of everything we did wrong, and eventually there was going to be hell to pay, literally. Right? But when I get this prayer thing down right, there is a connection formed where God isn't just watching me, He's in me. Where God is not just someone who's, I say, you're number one, God, let me know if you want anything from me. He's God that comes with me every moment of every day, and He is the life that we live. Is this making any sense? Is it possible to live a life centralized in Christ? That's a spiritual mind, a life that is centralized in Christ. The late, great Oswald Sanders said this, my goal is is God himself. Not peace, not happiness, not abundance. My goal is God himself. Can we pray that? My goal is God himself. My goal is not to have everything I want. My God is to be what he wants me to be. Amen? Watch this, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Here I am, Jesus said. King James says, Behold! <laughs> I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Don't we love that great salvation passage? Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any of you sinners hear and open the door, I'll come in and I will fellowship with you. That's what eat means. I will fellowship with you. You know the problem with that interpretation? is it's not biblical. When Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he was talking to the church. He was talking to a church. He was talking to believers, the believers of Laodicea. And he says to the church, 
I'm standing outside your building and knocking. <laughs> Wouldn't that be weird? We had church. Jesus spent the whole service outside knocking. And if we'd have just opened the door, he would have come in and eat with us. And in the Jewish mindset, that was the ultimate form of fellowship, of connection, of getting to know each other. Sharing food was sharing your life. Still is a little bit today. My body bears the trace of many fellowships. <laughs> Shut up. I'm standing at the door and knocking. And he says, let me in. Not to the sinful world, but to believers. I'm standing at the door. I'm not, I, hey, I want to hang out with you. I want to be a part of your fellowship. I, I want to be in your presence. I stand at the door and knock. Not to save you. You're already saved. You put your faith in me. I want to be a part of you. I want to be a part of your life. I want to connect with you. Isn't that amazing? That the God of the universe would want to connect with us? How many times have you set out to have a great prayer time and you even made this decision. I'm going to pray more. Give me a little amen there. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to pray more. And so I'm going to block off this time. And, uh, and I'm going to pray more. And a week later you realize you haven't prayed any more than you did before. You just made a plan. Listen, God is not an appointment. God is life. God is not an appointment. God is life. And I'm going to tell you why. I should preface that by saying I have a theory. <laughs> I haven't given you a chance to bounce back on that one in a while. That some of you guys, all right, some of us have started and fallen off the wagon on our prayer as often as we have our diets. We're going to pray more. We're going to be more spiritual. And I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, again, this is my theory as to why we fall off the wagon when it comes to being a good prayer person is that our prayer loses revelation. It loses revelation. And when prayer loses revelation, it becomes monotonous. It's just a religious activity. Lord, bless them, bless them, help me do this, do that. I don't know anything else to ask you for, so I'm done with this. And, but when prayer contains revelation, you look forward to it. You get excited about it. Have you ever tried to talk to someone who wouldn't talk? And all the ladies cut those stink eyes toward the husband. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that wives? Now some of you wives have husbands who won't shut up. Count your blessing even though you don't think it's a blessing. But most women I hear saying, he doesn't talk very much. And it's so frustrating because to a guy, you talk to communicate information. And if I don't know anything new, I'm not talking. But to a girl, usually, communication is intimacy. It's how we connect. And it's going to surprise you to hear this, but God is more like girls in this way. <laughs> I should say girls are more like God in this way. God wants to talk to you just to connect to you. And so what is happening now is when your prayer life reaches that level of revelation, you'll look forward to it. You'll get excited about it. This may seem weird to you, and you may call me the champion of all nerds. But if you were to tell me, I'm going to lock you up in a room with a Bible, and you're going to spend the week praying and studying, I'd go, yay. <laughs> that's, that's going to be great. That's going to be such an encounter of revelation. I'm going to learn some stuff that week from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. It's just going to be an incredible time. But when our prayer language or when our prayer experience has been lowered down to where there's no revelation, we don't come out of it knowing God any better than we went into it. It gets boring. 
But when you spend time in the presence of a God who just is unfathomable, there's so much you can learn about Him, you get excited about the next thing you're going to learn about Him. The next thing you're going to learn. So what we really need to do is get your prayer life to the level of revelation. Where you come out of your time with God knowing God better, knowing a new truth or new truths. Then you'll say, man, I can't wait till tomorrow. God is teaching me. God is showing me. I like to walk up to some people once in a while and say, what is the Lord dealing with you about? What do you mean? What is he saying to you? You've got a deep prayer life. He's talking to you. He's dealing with you about some stuff, isn't he? All right, that was my theory. Now let's get to the Word of God a little bit more here. How do you have a prayer life with revelation? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to hurry, but we're going to get seven keys right here in real quickly. You know me, I organize everything into lists. Here's how you get there. Did you know that, you know how the computer was invented? The computer that could process billions of bits of information a technician told me one time the computer was built on the simple question, what next? What next? So you can accomplish this, just ask, what next? Here's what's next. Number one, trust God's word. He said, I am standing at the door and knocking. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe that Jesus is standing outside of your heart's door, knocking, calling by you by name, saying, I'd really like to spend some time with you? If I got a call next week, I know I use this metaphor a lot, but it's, it's so important. If I got a call next week saying that the President of the United States would like to spend some time with me, I'd post it on Facebook, and I'd never speak to the rest of you again. <laughs> I'd be too important. But the fact that he would want to speak to me, that he'd want me to come to the White House and, and partake, it would be such an honor. Can I tell you something? One greater than the president wants to speak to you. Amen. One greater than the president is knocking at your door saying, Hey, you got time for lunch? I don't want to be a box you check. I want to be a life you live. I don't want to be a priority that you make sure stays where it should be. I want to be your life. I want to be the source of your life. Align your prayers with the Bible. God's word in more passages than I could ever begin to summarize in one sermon has invited you into Christ's presence. Can you trust those invitations? Can you believe Jesus really wants to be with you? He wants to go to work with you. He wants to go on vacation with you. He wants to travel with you. He wants to sit at home with you. He wants to be with you. Secondly, sanctify Jesus in your heart. Sanctify Jesus in your heart. He said, but in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Set him apart. Listen, here's something tweetable or snapchatable or Facebookable. It's true. Hang on to it. Put it wherever you can remember it for the next few days. A revelation from God takes place in the context of reverence for God. A revelation from God takes place in the context of reverence for God. Sanctify Jesus in your heart. Separate him from everybody else and say he is Messiah. Now, we heard just yesterday that Cameron and Madeline got engaged yesterday. Is that right, young? It blew up Facebook for a while. Congratulations. Let's give them a hand. (laughs) 
I didn't ask permission, but I'm going to use you as a sermon illustration. And they go, no. What they have just said to each other is I am going to sanctify you in my life and separate you from every other human being in my life and you will be different to me than anyone else. You will be alone in this place and no one will compete with you, no one will rival you, you will be my number one human being for the rest of my life, right? That's it. That's what marriage is. A long time ago, I learned a principle from an old gentleman that, I, that I, I've tried to teach many times. And you know me, I'm, I apologize, but I don't apologize. Sorry, not sorry. That I use um, marriage to illustrate the relationship we have with Christ because the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. But when I was just hadn't been married very long, I heard a principle and I tried to practice it and I think my wife could be the only one that tells you if I really have succeeded at it. But the, he called it the aha principle. And he said, gentlemen, don't ever let your wife walk into your presence without you acknowledging her. It's the aha and what that means to me and what I've tried to practice, if, you, um, if I were in my office and there were five or ten other people and we were having a meeting about something and my wife walked in, I would stop and I would acknowledge, hey, to acknowledge her above everybody else that's with an eye shot. I don't ever want to walk into my house at the end of the day walk in and sit down and say, what's for dinner? I want to walk in, find my wife, and have that, aha, you're here. You're here. Hello? It's that, aha. You are sanctified above everybody else in my life. The Bible says that God, Psalm 22, that God inhabits the praises of of his people. There is that aha moment. We look at God, we separate him from everybody else, and when he wants our attention, we go, aha, aha, yeah, there you are. You're speaking to me. You're talking to me. There cannot be a revelation of Jesus until there is reverence for Jesus. Amen. It's sanctify Jesus in your heart. Don't make him just part of the mass that's going on in your life right now. Notice I said mass, not mess. <laughs> you know. Don't make him just another item. Sanctify him. There will be times in your life you will be so busy, so locked down, so I call it jammed up. And the Lord will say, hey, I need to talk to you. There's some things I need to sort out with you. And if I have sanctified Jesus in my heart, I'll say, time out. Everything else, Jesus needs to talk to me about something. And I go off with him. See, It's like, again, most of us, if we were all bound up in all kinds of, of bases to, 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 uh, to tag, and our wife comes in, some point and says, hey, honey, I need to talk to you. We go, everybody else, hang on here a minute. I got, I got to figure out what's going on because the most important person in my life other than Jesus needs to bring something to my attention. Sanctify him in your heart. Did you get that? Can I go on? If you're going to run out of time, be late for the food buffet if you don't. Number three, share God's passion. God is passionate about building the kingdom. Are you on the same page with him? Our fellowship is greatest with those who share our passion. When there's someone who's helping us do something that we're really passionate about, we don't have to muster up a, a connection there. We just naturally connect with him because we're involved in something that's really important. 
The Bible says in Matthew chapter 9, verse 37, when, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Look at this, verse 38. Pray, pray, pray that the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. When my passion lines up with, with God's passion, I don't have to say, God, I need you to show up. He's there. He's already excited. If one of your kids were lost and wandering around the darkness and they were in grave danger and, and people showed up to say, can I help you search for them? We'd say, yes, I love you. Let's go. You know, we would pull our efforts and do everything because we would share a passion to save. And when we get all wrapped up in the things that God is passionate about, we find that our heart and God's, hearts are locking in, God's heart is locking, walking in lockstep. God is passionate about the most important task in the universe, which is bringing a lost world into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God is passionate about that. And when we say, God, help me do a better job of sharing you with my lost world, God shows up in force. When I say, God, by faith, I claim a bigger house. By faith, I claim a better automobile, which would be hard to do, you know, but, yeah. I, I claim this, and I, I think it's kind of hard for God to get real excited about those kind of prayers. James says you... Have not because you ask not, and you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. So that it's, you ask selfishly. But when God and you are sharing the same passion, He's there. Number four, seek direction for your prayers. The Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we do not, do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he searches our heart and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. The most common revelation I suspect in prayer is the thing we call guidance. The most common revelation, the Holy Spirit just begins to prompt us and move us in certain directions. One of, the, one of the most important things about keeping a prayer life is that we are prompted to go in certain directions that are in accordance with the will of God. You ever have this problem? You start praying and you get your mind wanders. You get down to pray and next thing you know, you smell your neighbor's supper cooking and you, you get thinking about, I wonder what we're having for dinner. You know, and are, are you, you hear a traffic go, and before you know it, all your mind is just moving everywhere. Anybody else there? I found an antidote. When my mind starts to wander, I suspect it's the Holy Spirit leading me. And I start praying about the things my mind is drifting to. If my mind begins to drift to the sound of that lawnmower, I suspect I need to pray for that man or that woman that's on that lawnmower. They may need Jesus or there may be something going on in their life. When something is distracting me, I at least entertain the idea that my distractions are actually the Holy Spirit directing me away from my, listen, away from my agenda and on to His. So just go. Just go with it. Just follow those distractions and see where they go. It could be that the Holy Spirit is saying, yeah, 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 you prayed that the last 99 times. Let's talk about this. Let's head down this path. Let's deal with this. Let's deal with the things that are relevant in your life. At least entertain this idea. That when God is not answering your prayers the way you're praying them, He may want you to pray a different way. 
And instead of being all upset because God is not obeying you very well, maybe you should stop. I've tried to entertain the discipline that if God isn't giving me what I am asking for, what I want, there's a very good chance that he's actually saying, no, I have something better for you. I'm not going to give you that because I've got something better for you. A spirit-directed prayer is a prayer according to the will of God. Let's roll. Number five, focus your faith. God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. You can believe. It's a mystery. You can believe. You think about what we believe as Christians, that a virgin gave birth. <laughs> yeah, how is that, you know? We believe that that child lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, was resurrected on the third day, ascended into heaven where he ever lives to listen to us, intercede for us. We have the faith to believe that. It's a supernatural gift of God to have faith. Now, I think that faith is very powerful, but now we have to focus it. I see people sometimes praying on social media where they'll say, God, save the world. And I'm going, that's not going to work. How about praying, God, save my lost neighbor. God, save my lost mom, my lost dad. How about saying, God, and focus your prayers. Focus your prayers. For prayer to work, it needs to be specific. Because when it's specific, you can get involved in it. Number six, it is where we are, isn't it? <laughs> Live your prayer life in the context of needs. What good is it, brothers? If a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such a faith save him? Suppose, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. It's hard to maintain an irrelevant prayer life. We do something on mission trips, don't we? You know, a lot of times when we're on a mission trip, in the morning we gather together and we pray and we say, God, we've come to this distant land. Please open up opportunities for us today to serve you. Lord, whatever we encounter today, please make us spiritually competent to deal with it. And, and we pray those those very specific prayers in the context of our mission trip. You know where I'm going? What if we started praying those kind of prayers in the context of our everyday mission trip? God, I'm going to encounter people today that I need to be ready to minister to. Help me be ready. Amen? Pray in the context of needs. To say, God, help everybody. No, it's not going to work. But God, today, make my life relevant. Make the anointing on my life relevant. Lord, when, when I process through this day, I'm going to encounter situations that only you know about now. Prepare me for that Live your prayer life in the context of needs. Please understand this. Are you listening? I'm trying to get finished, but you won't hurry up. Are you listening? You are the answer to prayers. You are the meeting of some needs. God is strategically placing you in context where you can make a difference for him pray like that pray like that pray god help me you, you know that old rascal you work with you know that you know that rascal you know that, that old rascal that's man antagonistic negative bitter just god maybe you could say god i gotta deal with someone who's obviously got issues 
Um, Help me. I used to be around a guy who was always so critical and so negative and so anti-Christianity and all that. And, I, and literally, I, maybe I, I shouldn't admit this, but I got to where I despised him. I just did not want to have to put up with him. And one day at one of my higher points... <laughs> I just stopped him in mid-sentence and I said, do you want to talk about it? He said, I said, you want to talk about what it is that created all this pain in you? You want to talk about whatever it is that has made you mad at God and everybody who loves God? If you ever want to talk about that, I might be able to help you with it. And it sort of disarmed the guy. You see, Pray in the context of your needs. Change that. Pray in the context of the needs of your world. Amen. Number seven. Here we go. Guard his glory. I believe that every time God answers a prayer, it creates glory. What we do with that glory is critical to our health and the health of the people who we influence. Did you ever notice that Jesus, when he performed miracles, he often looked around and said, don't tell anybody about this. Don't, just keep it to yourself and enjoy your healing and, and don't. But what does the church do? Somebody gets healed, we blow up social media and we wave all kinds of banners and we go, Jesus healed! I prayed and Jesus healed, you know? Because... When someone hears that I prayed and Jesus healed, people start saying good things about me. You know? And if I'm not very careful, I can start taking God's glory for mine. And then I become spiritually sick. It's toxic. I'm going to tell you something, friends. When God starts answering your prayers... And they start impacting other people's lives. Some of God's glory is going to get thrown at you. Don't keep it. Don't keep it. Just deflect it right up to him. Just keep deflecting it right up to him. Just keep on saying, no, it was him. It was him. Paul said in Galatians 1.24, they glorified God in me. They glorified God in me. After you've lived long enough, life has a way of humbling you, doesn't it? You go from walking with a strut to walking with a limp. <laughs> you know, you know, it's it's you know, I I am I am blessed in that I get a lot of affirmation in my life. I I get people tell me, oh, I love that, I love that, I love that. But it it never. This doesn't sound real humble, but it, it, I never am tempted to, to keep it because I have absolutely learned over the course of my life, all the Lord has to do is just back up a step or two and I fall flat on my face. I embarrass myself, you know. But God wants to use you in a way that's going to create glory. Be careful. Be careful out there. Because when people start uttering your name in close proximity to his, be sure you pull yours back down. Be sure you make it known. He's everything. I'm nothing. Amen? As your pastor, I, I need you guys to have a better prayer life. <laughs> It'd be easier to pastor if you were. That was meant to be a joke, but it fell flat. So, <laughs> I'd really like for you to have a great prayer life. I'd like Jesus to be number one in your life. But I don't want him just to be the number one sovereign watching you. He needs to be in you. He needs to be there when you slip from the number one, you start dealing with number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninety-nine. 99. 
He still needs to be there. Not just number one, but everything. Every place. For you to live as Christ. That should be the theme of your life. For me to live is Christ. Some of you have tried this prayer thing, and again, it's like your diet. Someone said the other day, the first day of the diet's where you clean all this bad stuff out of the house, and man, it was delicious. <laughs> it's, it's like a diet for you. It's just, uh, I got to try to willpower my way into being disciplined and carve out some time for Jesus, because Poor Jesus will get lonely if I don't hang out with him. That's not prayer. It's not prayer. Prayer has revelation in it. Prayer, you encounter God. And you're changed by God. And you walk away from that encounter with him knowing something you didn't know about him. Right? And when you get here, you'll start enjoying prayer walks. You'll start saying, I hope I get home in time to go out and take a walk, just me and Jesus. You'll start hoping you get up in time that before your daily schedule crushing, you've got time just to sit quietly in his presence, to have a cup of coffee and listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. It won't be a chore. It will be a delight. But you've got to get there at the revelation point where he's talking to you and you're not doing all the talking. Will you bow your heads with me, please? I'd like you to stand with me. I know I just told you to bow your heads, but can I ask you to lift up your head and look at me? Just look at me. Look me in the eye. Hear me. I will never be able to take you further than your prayer life. I hope I can teach you, inspire you, set a good example for you. But I will never have the ability, nor any other preacher, will ever have the ability to take you beyond your prayer life. This is not just religious stuff, it's life. It's life. So I challenge you today, wipe the slate clean. All the times you've tried and failed, just wipe the slate clean. Take these notes, not because I wrote them, but because they're based in the Word, and start building you great prayer life. Amen? Now you can bow your heads. Father, make my brother a warrior in prayer. Make him a man who utters the mysteries of the eternal age from his lips under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Make my brother a powerful force. A force that is able with his confession to bind the enemy. To drive out the works of darkness over his family. To cover with the canopy of your grace through his confession. His family, his life. Lord, make my sister an interceder. Lord, I pray that when she calls on Jesus, that she would sense all of heaven just paused to listen. I pray that her prayers would dispatch from your presence power and healing and deliverance. I pray that when she prays, 
the kingdom of darkness trembles. I pray that the enslaved, those held in bondage, begin to feel the weakening of the power of the enemy. And something is happening. In the realm of the Spirit, something is happening. Lord, make us men and women of prayer. And Father, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, I ask you to give them the faith right now to believe in their heart and confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord. And in doing so, Lord, they're acknowledging that you died on the cross for all of their sins. And everyone has been paid for through the precious blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that sinner's prayer with us, please let us know. We need to help you get started. So tell an usher, tell me, tell somebody, because we need to help you get going. Hey, next week, I'm real excited. I've got a brand new uh, series I'm going to start. It's called Using the Power of the Storm. Using the Power of the Storm. Turning your pain into victory. So I really really feel like God is going to do something real special uh, over these next few weeks. So be sure. In fact, we're going to try and send that uh, ad out to you. Be sure you forward it to everybody you know. Using the Power of the Storm. Right now, smile real big. And before you leave, meet someone you haven't met before. Shake their hand. Welcome them. See you back next week.